Our second scripture lesson today continues from the book of James, uh, where we left off. Uh, we're beginning at James 3.13, going through chapter 4, verse 8. Um, and I invite you to listen for James's wisdom. This is actually considered the only wisdom book of the New Testament. In the Old Testament, we have Psalms and Proverbs and Song of Solomon and all that. But in the New Testament, James is the only one that is, uh, that is ca- categorized as a wisdom book. So hear now the word of the Lord from James 3 and 4. Who is wise and understanding among you? Show by your good life that your works are done with gentleness, born of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not be boastful and false to the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, devilish. For where there is envy and selfish ambition, there will also be disorder and wickedness of every kind. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. And a harvest of righteousness is is sown in peace for those who make peace. Those conflicts and disputes among you, where do they come from? Do they not come from your cravings that are at war within you? You want something and you do not have it, so you commit murder. And you covet something and cannot obtain it, so you engage in disputes and conflicts. You do not have because you do not ask. You do not ask or you ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly in order to spend what you get on your pleasures. Adulterers, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you suppose that it's for nothing, the scripture says, God yearns jealously for the spirit he has made to dwell in us. But he gives all the more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Saints, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Last week, I mentioned some statistics about words and vocabulary that I found interesting, and One of which was that for most people, by the time we get to middle age, we're pretty much done learning words. Our vocabulary stopped growing. Now, I want to point out that you all are a truly exceptional bunch, and I wasn't talking about any of you. (laughs) However, if you did identify with that statement, I'm here to help. Merriam-Webster, the dictionary people, are constantly adding new words to their online dictionary. Uh, thousands of words every year these days, and they highlight words of the month and of the year that are particularly relevant. For example, 2020's word of the year was pandemic. I guess they were being optimistic, or maybe they're just going to run it again for 2021. I don't know. But some of the other $5 words that they have highlighted are uh, egregious, lodestar, gaff, exculpate, And one of my personal favorites, schadenfreude. It's a good German word. Part of why uh, Merriam-Webster are so busy these days is that this generation seems to like creating new words. Words like FOMO. Honey, do you know what that one means? FOMO, fear of missing out. It's when you are, are so concerned that people somewhere might be having fun without you that you say yes to everything. You want to do everything, even when you really just need to do nothing and and rest and and take care of yourself. Athleisure, that's what it sounds like. Comfy clothes that look like they are for exercise, but really most people just wear them to look good and, and be comfortable. And then frenemy, a friend who is also an enemy. The gist of this one is that we needed a word to describe those sorts of acquaintances with whom we're just not quite sure where we stand. 
Maybe it's a person you have lots in common with, and it seems like you should be friends, but you find yourselves in constant competition and conflict with them. They're always getting in the way of your success. Or maybe they're friendly to you in certain settings, but not in others so much. Or maybe there's someone who has been your fiercest opponent for so long that over time you've really developed a mutual admiration and respect for each other. Well, we often think there are clear distinctions between our friends and our enemies. It turns out that there are a lot of people who are somewhere in the middle, who kind of ride the line. We might like them, despite the way that they treat us, or we might be annoyed to no end by them, despite the fact that they really love us. They're big fans of us. Frenemies. James' wisdom in what we read in his letter today has a lot to do with friendship and enmity, with conflicts and disputes. And the big opposition that he sets up is between God and the world, between our pursuit of God's will and pursuit of worldly things, of our own worldly cravings. And while James describes everything in this kind of cosmic dualism, opposing forces language, I think he recognizes the trouble that there is an internal conflict in us. He says that we can either be friends with the world or friends with God, but not both. And nevertheless, we still try. Nevertheless, we seem to want it both ways when it comes to our relationship with God. We, we think of God in, in friendly terms. We think that we are friends of God. In our heads, we like God, or the idea of God at least, and we certainly want and, and hope and expect to be found on God's good side. We're the people God likes, right? But in practice, what we seek and what we pursue and what we spend our time and our effort and our energy and our money on is so often out of whack with what God really wants of us. The goals that we set are self-interested. The desires that we have are worldly. The harvest we work toward is unspiritual. And at some level, we know God stands against those things. God is our opponent, who we're going to have to outwit or outmaneuver, or he is going to thwart us. We are frenemies of God, I think. Wanting to like him, wanting him to like us, but having to admit in our hearts that we aren't always after the same things. In these verses, James describes how we lose track of the true friendship with God for which we are made. You know, how is it that we find ourselves so deeply entrenched against someone who we claim to love? It all begins with a wisdom conflict. The letter describes wisdom that comes from above and wisdom that comes from below. And the wisdom from above is pure and peaceable and gentle and willing to yield and full of mercy and without partiality or hypocrisy. When James talks about wisdom, remember that although we usually think about wisdom as a head thing, as about knowledge and what you know, his emphasis is always on our behavior. It's not what you know. It's what you do because of what you know. It's how what you know changes your actions. Heavenly wisdom is expressed in action. Forgiveness when other people hurt you. Fair-minded judgment in situations where you might want to be biased. Straightforward honesty. The ability to compromise with another who wants something different from you. Wisdom from above is so good at recognizing the necessary interrelationships between myself and others, and this wisdom leads to a harvest of peace. It leads to us being able to get along harmoniously, to coexist with each other. The alternative wisdom, that from below, earthly wisdom, is characterized by bitter envy and selfish ambition, dishonesty leading to disorder and wickedness. And what strikes me here is that James doesn't identify the opposite of heavenly wisdom as foolishness. The opposite of heavenly wisdom is selfishness, envy, ambition grown out of control. The reason we get sideways with God is not that we lack knowledge or good sense, it's that we lack empathy. We don't care what's good for God 
or anyone else. We put ourselves first in all things. There was this popular Netflix series called House of Cards. It was one of the first ones that they uh, developed when they were really getting into, um, or into streaming content. And uh, it's the saga of the fictional U.S. Senator Frank Underwood and all his political machinations to exact vengeance on those who he feels have wronged him in some way over his career. Frank is cold and calculating and ruthless. And as the series goes on, he ascends in power and he becomes the absolute embodiment of that adage, absolute power corrupts absolutely. I'll try not to spoil anything and simply say that there is no shortage of dishonesty, disorder, and wickedness as Frank builds his house of cards. Ironically, though, the character Frank Underwood was played by the actor Kevin Spacey. And right as the series was reaching its peak, the actor's own house of cards fell apart on him. Multiple allegations of assault came out. And the new picture that, that began uh, surfacing in the public eye was this image of a talented and once beloved film icon who was really secretly a predator, who preyed on those who couldn't defend themselves and those he, he could manipulate into staying quiet afterward. His eventual response to the accusations demonstrated that he knew the behavior was wrong, even if he didn't actually admit to doing it. In all this, Spacey demonstrated a sort of selfishness that was not due to lack of wisdom or understanding. Indeed, it required great shrewdness and willingness to abuse the ambition of others in order to get away with what he was doing for so long. The wisdom from below is earthly, unspiritual, devilish, and we're all well acquainted with it. Even if our own expression of it doesn't usually land us in the courtroom. That earthly wisdom is the pride that leads to us lashing out when nobody's giving us the credit we think we deserve. It's the need to reach the top of the heap without really having an honest self-appraisal of what might make us better suited for that position than anybody else. It's the desire for what our neighbor has and the willingness to take it. It's the desire to have what isn't ours or to ruin it for someone else if we find that we can't get it from them. Because we have wisdom, we know how to achieve what we want. Because we have wisdom, we are perfectly aware of the consequences of our choices. But because that wisdom doesn't come from above, we're too self-interested to care. We only want what we want, and we ignore all the ways that it's going to hurt somebody else. The result of this kind of wisdom is enmity with God. The wisdom that gets us where we want to be in the world is a wisdom that drives us directly away from God's kingdom, away from God himself. As James says, if we want to be friends with the world, we cannot also be friends with God. Whereas I use the word frenemy to describe that relationship, James uses an even stronger one that may be shocking to us, but I think it's accurate. He says we're adulterers. Adultery in the marital sense happens when one partner decides their own happiness is more important than the loyalty that they have vowed to the other. They decide unilaterally to abandon the partnership and to go off in search of what it is they think will fulfill them, to seek their own goals. Now this happens with us too, spiritually. It's as if there's a marriage between us and God. Scripture is full of this marriage imagery with, with the, the church being the bride of Christ, with the, the Israelites being the, the beloved wife of God. There are promises. There are vows. We belong to him. He belongs to us. We're supposed to have this partnership and fidelity and constancy with God. And then along comes this pretty young thing named self-satisfaction. And off we go chasing it and leaving God with an empty home. For us to choose worldly wisdom and selfish pursuits is profoundly disloyal to God. Note, though, that adultery on its own doesn't end a marriage, at least not in the technical sense. The cheating husband is still a husband. The cheating wife is still a wife. 
And the possibility remains that there will be forgiveness and reconciliation. Of course, it depends a lot on the attitude of the wounded party. We might go wandering and find when we get back that the spouse we failed to consider is nevertheless waiting patiently for us to come to our senses. Or we might find they have no patience left for us. But God yearns jealously for the spirit that he has made to dwell in us. What that means is there's no point at which God stops loving us. There is no point when God stops longing for us to come home. God is jealous over us. That's another interesting word. Jealousy usually has really negative connotations for us, right? It's often used interchangeably with envy. When we say, I'm jealous of you, what we really mean is, I'm envious of you. I I, I wish I had what you have. Maybe I even wish I could be you. I could take your place. But jealousy, according to the dictionary, is something different from envy. Jealousy means fighting to keep something from being stolen away. Jealousy means guarding what is already yours, whereas envy means trying to take what is not yours. God yearns jealously for us. Wherever we stray, however long we might lose sight of it, God never stops wanting us to be part of his family. And so God will fight for us long after we may have given up fighting for him. God will not give up on this partnership. God is jealous over us, jealous over you. And that is a very good thing, friends. While envy might drive us away, jealousy in the end can bring us back home. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God, saints. If there is distance, if there's a rift between us and God, it's not because he wants it that way. It's only because of our choices. It's only because we are too proud, too arrogant, trying to force the world to match our desires rather than going to God to find out and to receive what it is we truly need from him. Frenemies of God, quit it. Quit your double-mindedness. Stop being stuck in the middle, sometimes for and sometimes against. Give God your whole heart. Draw near to him and he will draw near to you. Indeed, you'll find that he has always been right there. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.